So this is series. Uh, I like this picture because you can see the two class of features that we often talk about as, quote, uh, possibly being cryovolcanic. You can see the uh, one of the bright spots, Akatur bright spot. And then on the limb, you can see a Hunamans here. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to basically ignore all the bright spots because I'm going to try and constrain the total cryovolcanic history uh, of the body. Uh, and the bright spots are just relatively thin deposits, so they're volumetrically dominated by uh, the mountains if, if the, both of those features are indeed cryovolcanic. So we've already heard uh, a good introduction from Julie to the Dawn mission, so I'm not going to bother redoing that. We've heard a little bit about Ahuna Mons. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to summarize the entirety of the, the first Ahuna Mons paper uh, by Taviano Roos, um, but I will note, here's a picture. There's no vertical exaggeration here. Uh, it is a prominent young mountain on Ceres. Uh, it's very clearly an outlier in, in, in its uh, topographic relief and youth combination. Um, it's about four kilometers tall. It's at most 240 million years old. That is an upper age constraint because it's crater. It's a, a, an age constraint of an underlying unit that the mountain superposes. So the mountain is younger than that. Um, and Roos et al, I uh, interpret this as, as a cryovolcanic construct, um, like we've already heard, mostly based on the idea that it looks like a, a lava dome. Um, that's maybe being a little bit too simplistic, but that's most of the argument. So the problem um, that I'm addressing, and that's bothered me since this mountain was first discovered, uh, is why is there only one of them? Um, and I've heard a few people sort of whispering that question in the audience in, in uh, the past few talks. Um, so there are a few classes of solutions you might think of. Um, probably the least satisfying one is that Ceres has a weird thermal history and it was not volcanically active for 4.4 billion years and then just turned on very recently. Um, obviously, you can tell by the way I'm talking about that that I don't find that very satisfying. Um, the other two classes of ideas that could solve this problem are that there's some process that modifies or erases mountains like Ahuna Mons over time. Uh, or that Ahuda Mons is, is just not cryovolcanic in the first place and our interpretation isn't correct. So let's go a little bit more specific into these types of uh, ideas. As far as things that can modify topography on an airless body, you might think of uh, landscape diffusion, um, small impacts slowly flattening topography over time, removing topographic relief. Uh, on an icy body, you might think of sublimation uh, or viscous deformation of topography. And then as far as Ahunamans not being cryovolcanic in the first place, another way that topography is built on airless bodies is, is by impacts. Uh, and you might think of something having to do with broadly tectonics or, or diatourism. So I'm going to cross out a lot of these. Um, we don't have, we, we haven't fully quantified landscape diffusion on Ceres, but if it's like other bodies, it shouldn't quickly affect uh, landforms tens of kilometers in scale like Ahunamans. Um, sublimation, people on the team, uh, like Margaret Landis have showed that sublimation also doesn't happen fast enough. You should build up a, a something akin to a sublimation lag, and it should not should not be able to erase four kilometers of tropographic relief um, when the ice when the shell is not pure ice. Uh, I can't think of really any way to make an isolated tall mountain like this from from an impact. Um, so the two I'm going to focus on are viscous relaxation um, and tectonics. So for so viscous relaxation is the part of the project that, that I've led, so I'm going to focus most of the time on that. Um, but I will address the, uh, the spirit of a, of a question that Bill asked in the last talk, if not maybe the exact mechanism of what if, what if these mountains are, are just not extrusive products to begin with. Um, and this is, this is some work led by Mike Bland, um, so I'll, I'll briefly talk about that at the end. And I think both hypotheses are, are viable. I don't think right now with the data, I'll, I'll, I'll just say from the start that we can prove these things are, are extrusive features. Okay, so right, so the two, the two more specific mechanisms, I'll refer to them as cryovolc cryovolcanism and decay. That's the idea that cryovolcanoes are erupting throughout Ceres' history, or throughout a lot of Ceres' history, uh, and then older ones viscously relax over time, so they don't have this tall prominent shape, and Ahunamans is, is just sufficiently young such that it has not been modified by this process yet. And then the other process uh, I'll call ice tectonics. They're, um, we're drawing an analogy to salt tectonics on Earth, where you have movement in the subsurface driv driven mostly by uh, differential topographic loading. 
Okay, so let's start with the viscous relaxation hypothesis, which is what I'll spend most of the time talking about. First, we need to ask the question, can viscous relaxation even occur at all on series? Uh, and to do that, you, you, need, you need it to not be completely rock, and you need the near surface to not be mostly rock. So uh, the first requirement is you need, you need some ice in the outer layer. Um, and in fact, the, all the geophysical analyses show some level of differentiation between the rocky part of Ceres and the icy part. It's not as complete for other bodies. Um, somewhat interestingly, uh, Mao and McKinnon point out that if all you had was the shape of Ceres, you, you might conclude that it was not differentiated at all. But once you take the gravity and the shape um, in tandem, I think everyone agrees that there must be some level of differentiation interpreted as an ice enrichment in, the, in some outer layer. However, uh, we see plenty of craters all over Ceres, plenty of craters of different sizes. We see them in all different regions. Uh, and that at least tells you that viscous relaxation is not a completely dominant process in erasing all of the topography uh, over short time scales. With that being said, um, Ceres, it turns out, is, is complicated in a lot of ways. Um, and one way that it's complicated is it seems that there's, there is some evidence from the geophysical data and from some crater topography that viscous relaxation occurs under some favorable conditions, at least on Ceres. Um, and so that might mean something like elevated heat flows in some regions and times or elevated ice content. Um, so the bottom line that I want to uh, take away from all this is that even though viscous relaxation is not completely dominant in removing all topographic relief from Ceres, it still, under, uh, it still occurs under favorable conditions. It may not occur everywhere on the series crust for all wavelengths of topography, but the main message here is you don't need to increase the ice content by that much relative to the average Syrian crust in order to, to really kick uh, viscous relaxation into action. So that is really forming the basis of this idea. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna spend slides uh, on methodology really. I'll just tell you that what we do in this uh, project is we take finite element models uh, we, we solve the appropriate equations, and, and we have thermal models to tell us what we think the temperature is. Uh, and we model how topography uh, viscously relaxes over time. So our starting point, a sort of a nominal case, is, uh, is the topography of Ahunamans itself. We assume this is the initial profile for, for a cryovolcano. Um, and and we, we do our finite elements, and we, and we let it relax over time. Uh, the free parameter is ice content. If you go below 40% or so of ice, um, you know, that number is approximate, so don't take it too seriously to, to too many decimal points. But if you go below 40% or ice, you, you expect things to lock up and, and not be dominated by ice flow at all. Uh, and then, of course, as you get more and more ice, uh, you, you get faster and faster flow. So under this idea, uh, Ahunamans might have lots of topographic relief and, and look very pristine. What we would expect is to see lots of things that are flattened and deformed all over series. Um, that represents stages of this viscous relaxation process. So we look for, uh, we do a search for these sorts of domes. Um, this has been, this was published in one of the first uh, geomorphology papers from, uh, from the Dawn mission by Bukowski et al. in 2016, um, in inventoried some of the domes. That's been updated in a, a current paper that's, that's now in review by Sizemore et al. Um, that paper identified 33 domes, this is, these are things of positive topographic relief, convex uh, curvature. They're all a kilometer or so more in topographic relief and <coughs> tens of kilometers uh, in diameter. Uh, for this project, I've taken, uh, I've been a little bit more conservative and, and chosen 21 of the 33 that I think we can actually reliably measure and that I don't think are likely to be formed by like impact of ejecta piling up or something like that. Okay, so here's the, these diamonds are the locations of all the domes on series. Red is Ahunamans, you, this is the topography down here. And then purple is uh, this unnamed um, positive relief feature. Um, and I'm calling this out as an example of something that might be a viscously relaxed version of Ahunamans. And you can see here that there, it's lower topo topographic relief, a little bit wider, uh, about the same volume if you, if you add it all up. Uh, so the idea is that uh, it started looking something like Ahunamans, lost topographic relief, flattened out over time, and now it looks like this. Uh, and here's just the images, and you can see Ahunamans appearing very prominently in the image. Uh, and if, if you squint, you can see the, the other dome here. Um, and, and it's subtle, which, which, is, which is sort of the point, that it's hard to see. 
Okay, so I don't want to um, necessarily assume that every dome started looking exactly like a Hunemans. Um, so instead, I assume that it conserves volume and started looking like something uh, with the same aspect ratio as a Hunemans. So that's the metric that I'm going to be talking about for, for the rest of the talk. So uh, here, here are just the, the heights as a function of diameter. Okay, so to test the hypothesis, um, we're going to plot the aspect ratio as a function of latitude. What we expect to happen with viscous relaxation, uh, rheology of ice is very, like rheology of most materials, is very sensitive to temperature. So what we expect is warmer things near the equator should viscously relax faster. Anything that appears at the poles should viscously relax slower. In fact, it turns out that if you're at the pole of series, it's, it's too cold, according to what we think we know about the ice physics, to, to viscously deform at all. Okay, so here are the, uh, the 21 domes that are not a Hunemans. Here their aspect ratio is a function of latitude. Uh, there is the aspect ratio of a Hunemans itself. Uh, it's about 0.2. This is uh, height divided by average diameter. And what we're going to do is we're going to start, have them all start off looking something like a Hunemans and then run our finite element model and see what the aspect ratio is after X years. So if you start everywhere with an aspect ratio of 0.21, this is what it looks like uh, after 300 million years of viscous deformation. This is all, all the results I'm going to show are 50% um, ice composition um, and then 50% other stuff. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Now if we go farther in time, if we let it relax for 600 million years, uh, now hopefully you get the idea. Here's a bunch more curves, here are a bunch more time scales. Um, th these are the models, the lines are the models, and again the, the points are the observations. Um, and you might say that you have uh, reasonably good agreement. Uh, with the model and the observations. Um, and so the, the really big part of this um, is, of course, this data point. Um, the dome, there's a dome at the pole called Yamormons, which is very high in topographic relief and, and, and very steep and very aspect ratio. It's really the only dome on series that looks like a Hunemans. Uh, and it's at the pole, which is, which is what we're predicting. So, and similarly, you don't see those examples um, at low latitudes. And you see a little bit more spread at mid latitudes than you see at low latitudes. Okay, so of course, it would be nice if, if there were 20 domes at the poles um, and they all appeared here. It turns out Ceres doesn't really care what I want, um, and, and there's only one. So I don't want to, you know, you know, trick you and, and put all the, all the certainty into this, but it might be telling that the only two domes that are really steep with a really high aspect ratio in Ceres are the one that is clearly very young and the one that's at the pole. So, I consider this at least moderate support of the, of the viscous deformation hypothesis, right? There's, there's just the, what I said in bullet points. Um, okay, now I'm going to get a little bit more speculative. If you accept that as the mechanism that's really going on, then you can do some neat things by adding up the volume of the domes from the topographic data sets and putting an age estimate from my viscous relaxation models these models assume that it starts looking like a Hunemans and, and again relaxes over time. Um, if you do that, here's a histogram of the ages of those 21 constructs as a function of, of time. Uh, it ends up being, it ends up averaging that you form one Hunemans every 50 million years. And you can do fancy statistics on this and show that all, basically all this structure isn't real. You can't statistically distinguish this from a, just a uniform distribution with any meaningful confidence. Uh, now you can uh, start to think about comparing this to the, to the rates of other bodies because now we have volume, we have, we have age, so we can convert that into rates. So on series, it turns out to be something like 10 to the 4 cubic meters of uh, extrusion per year. You can, you can compare that to the terrestrial planets, Venus, Earth, Moon, and Mars, uh, and series is, is orders of magnitude lower than all of them. You could say, well, that, that's sort of cheating because series is smaller. So, so here's the same plot, but now it's just normalized by surface area. So it's just the, the, all the rates divided by the surface area of the planet. Uh, and even when you normalize by surface area, Ceres is, is lower than the other planets. Um, so the, the big takeaway message here is, you know, again, all the caveats about if this is, is really what's going on. But if these domes are cryovolcanic, um, then cryovolcanism seems to be you know, interesting, important, and all that, but not as important on Ceres as basaltic volcanism is on the terrestrial planets. This is, you know, maybe not surprising because I'm, I'm adding up 
little mountains and, and a lot of the other planets have broad planes of basalt like you know, the moon or Venus. Uh, so this may not apply to other bodies. I know we're going to hear a few talks about uh, possible smooth planes volcanism on Charon. Um, and I got, a, I, I got reviews back from this paper today actually and a reviewer pointed out to me that Europa also has estimates of the uh, extrusion rate uh, and those from my quick glance of, at that paper would be 10 to the 7 so they would be somewhat moon-like. Um, so that would also be higher than Ceres. So Ceres is not quite as active as, as these other bodies. Okay, so that's one idea. Um, that's all great. I think it is at least consistent with the data available to us. I don't think we can prove it um, from, from the Dawn data. So now I'll spend a couple slides talking about a different hypothesis that I think is also viable. Uh, and again, this is led by Mike Bland, and he is invoking something akin to salt tectonics on Earth. And the main idea here is that you have uh, material of different density and rheology. So you have relatively high density, high rheology uh, material on top, overlying low density, low rheology material, and this creates um, a, a difference in, in loading and it, and it sort of pushes the material and under the right conditions can cause doming. So this is a way that you could plausibly uh, cause positive topography on a body. Um, so this is all solid state, state flow stuff. And, and if you're interested in the salt tectonics, here's you know, near to where we are now, near Houston, here's some domes that are thought to be formed by salt tectonics on Earth. We call it salt tectonics because on Earth, this low, uh, the low density, low viscosity material is salt. On Ceres, we're invoking ice, so I'm using the term ice tectonics to fulfill the role that salt plays on Earth. Okay, so here's just a quick example of, of some of Mike's simulations. Um, if you have a layer of material, the blue in this case would be ice, or if not pure ice, something that's more ice rich than the, the yellow. Uh, and then you have topography in the form of crater causing different craters causing differential loading. And if you start with an initial condition that looks like this, and you, and you run the model over time, you, you can get something like this after a few hundred thousand years. Um, you know, I'll, I'll refer you to, to Mike's LPSC abstract um, if you're interested in, in some of the more parameter space. Um, but but the, the basic idea is that you, you can cause, again, domes of positive topography if you start with the correct configuration of ice-rich material versus relatively ice-poor material. Um, and then, you, and then you know, once we accept that, we, we need to decide how realistic is a setup like this. Um, you could just sort of vaguely invoke heterogeneity and ice content in the crust, and then a crater happens to form in the right spot. Uh, another idea is that perhaps an impact devolatilizes the area right beneath the crater, and, and, and you're left with ice here. Um, that, that's an issue that, that needs to be addressed in this idea, but, but again, you can get the right topography. Okay, and indeed, um, here's an example of one of the domes on Ceres, right here, is the positive green topography. And it's, and it's inside of a crater, uh, a larger crater, and it's, and it's near the crater rim, and that's what's predicted by uh, this configuration, model configuration. Okay, so I'll talk, let me just briefly before I end, sort of talk about the two ideas in comparison to each other. On the left, we have viscous relaxation. This is an Ahunamans-like dome, and this is just the vertical flow velocity um, per year. Uh, so the big power in, in the viscous relaxation hypothesis is that it very nicely explains why the two really prominent steep domes are the one really young one and the, run, the one really polar one. Um, the trick is you need to, to then invoke a, a softer rheology than the average series, series crust. In contrast for the, the diapirs from the ice tectonics idea, um, the nice thing about that is you invoke some sort of intrusive activity. This isn't an intrusion like, like we sometimes talk about, about melt intruding and not penetrating the surface. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the nice thing about that is we know on planets that, that have extrusive activity that there is also other activ geologic activity going on. So it's nice to have things that we can point to that might be the signature of that. Um, and the downside is it, it doesn't explain the problem that I, that I started with this talk. It doesn't explain why Ahuna Mons is, is so weird and, and, and so young. Um, but maybe it's just a, a statistical oddity. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is ultimately, maybe we don't, you know, this may seem like a, a bit of a, a cheap exit, but maybe we can just invoke different mechanisms for, for different pieces of topography. And like I said, we know on other geologically active planets that, that you have both, both extrusive and intrusive activity. So that may not be so much of a problem. Um, right, so here are all those conclusions that I, that I just said uh, written in text form. Uh, I'll point you to, we had a paper a year ago proposing the viscous relaxation idea. 
And then we have a few other papers that are in various stages of, of review or preparation or revision. Uh, so for now, I'll point you to the LPSC abstracts if you're interested in the other parts of the project. Thanks.